So you, you've got once a year hugs from Reverend Dakota. Well, we hope that maybe it'll be this annual affair. <laughs> <laughs> so tell me again, where were you born? I was born in Otisville, East Otisville, commonly known as Pugliville, uh, on February 5th. 1914, and it was so cold the day I was born. In fact, I told the doctor how cold it was. And uh, Dr. Haskell from Oxford was the attending physician, and uh, he came over in a horse and sleigh, and I was delivered, and uh, that was that. Did you always live in Otisville? I've lived in Otisville for 89 years. And I, I worked in Portland right out of high school for a couple of years, but I certainly didn't live there. I'm not a city boy. I had to work until noon on Saturdays, and when it came noon, my little satchel was all packed, and I was long gone. I'd come home sometimes and just say hi to my father and mother, and then just take a walk down in the woods. Get out of the city. <laughs> How old were you at that time? Oh, I was probably 18, 19. It was in 1932, 33, and until December 34. How'd you get home? I drove home. Uh, sometimes... Uh, I drove home with a pretty expensive car that belonged to my boss, and my boss happened to be my cousin. And uh, he'd say, here, take my car, so. Um, what was it like when you were uh, uh, a young child? What uh, kind of place did you live? What uh, was it? Uh, there was a, a two-story building, two and a half, I suppose. Uh, with a store underneath that my grandfather, Ellis I. Stone, uh, ran for a good many years, and there was a little house right beside the store, and that's where I was born. And in those days, we had neither electricity or running water. If, if we didn't have a refrigerator. We didn't have a 
modern refrigerator, electric, of course. We had an ice box, and my father and I would go down on the lake and cut ice, haul it up, and put it in a ice house with an old horse and and sleigh, and not sleigh, a sled, and then we'd go to a mill and get a load of sawdust and pack the ice in it. And in the summer we took a cake of ice out, took a pail of water and washed it all off and put it in the refrigerator. And my mother uh, set milk in a pan in the cellar way so the cream would rise and then she'd skim it off and we'd make our own butter. And when I was growing up, I, I got into some horrible troubles. I bet. Uh, Dad and Mother decided they were going somewhere one day and told Phil and, and me to behave ourselves and we said we would, but there was a mill pond, it was in the spring, and it was full of logs, pine logs, and there was great gobs of pine pitch on the ends of them. And somebody had told me that you could heat that up on the stove and put it through a sieve or a strainer or something, and then people used it for scrapes and abrasions and bumps and bruises, and especially a wood splinter that you had trouble getting out. You put a little pine pitch on it and uh, it would draw the splinter out. Well, as soon as Dad and Mother left, Phil and I got out several of our kettles and went up and scraped pine pitch off in the bottom of those logs and came home. And of course, we didn't have an electric stove or a gas stove. We had to fire up the wood stove and we heated up the pitch, got out a strainer, lots of jars. And when my mother came home, there was pitch from the floor to the ceiling. All of, <laughs> all of the utensils were a mess. Did you throw any? Did you start playing around with it and throwing at each other? Oh, no. We were going to sell it. We, that oh. was the idea. We was refining it and was going to sell it for so people put, could put it on their wounds and And bumps, splinters. Splinters. So and you, you didn't sell any? No, we didn't, didn't sell any. It all disappeared. <laughs> uh, oh, Phil and I got into a lot of trouble. Uh, we used to go skunk hunting in the fall. We didn't even have a flashlight. All we had was a kerosene lamp. And you see a skunk and you run right at him just as fast as you can. And it takes him a little while to get ready to spray you. And if you hit him right on the nose, he's dead right off quick. And we used to go out in the evening with our lantern and get skunks. And I'd skin them out and stretch their skins. And one day, one evening, we went out and uh, we were up in the pasture across from where Bob Grover used to live and we saw this skunk and we ran right after him and he went under a great big rock that was kind of a cave and Phil got down on his knees and said well his tail is right out this way uh, Somebody had told him that if you got a skunk by his tail, got his feet off the ground, he couldn't do anything. And he says, you hold the lantern and I'll reach in there and grab him by the tail and drag him right out here. Well, I held the lantern and he had to get back where he couldn't see and he reached in and grabbed him, but the skunk had turned around. He got him right behind the ears and dragged him right out and you know the rest of the story. Oh. <laughs> and that was the end of Phil's and my skunk hunting, you can imagine. <laughs> I went to school in East Otisville in a one-room schoolhouse, eight grades generally, once in a while nine grades, they had a kindergarten, one teacher, and I think we learned a lot more <laughs> than they do in these fancy schools today. <laughs> I remember 
one of the bigger boys, I won't mention any names, I was a little afraid of him because he was a lot bigger than I was. One of my chores was at noon I had to sweep the floor, but we were supposed to put it in a basket, but there was a back window open, and there was a bank in down back, so some of the boys had a plank set up by the window, and this guy had crawled up the plank. I didn't see him. I went to the window and give it a heave, and it hit him right in the face. And he hollered, and I ran way up on top of the hill, and I wouldn't come down till after the bell rang because if I knew, I knew that if he ever caught me, I'd had it. <laughs> <laughs> Where was the school located? Was it Bell Hill? No, no. The East Otisfield School is just above the mill pond there, right opposite Cobb Hill Road. Oh, okay. And. Uh, wasn't any such thing as a uh, prepared hot lunch that was done by a cook there. Uh, my mother and several other of the women in the winter time might send a, a big kettle of chowder or soup or something, and there wasn't such any such thing as transportation here and there except. Al Edwards had an old horse and used to haul some of the kids from Scribner Hill, Cobb Hill, Cobb Hill. Ever since I was born in 1914, that had been the new road until a few years ago. Somebody came up on Cobb Hill. That's more or less like Moose Pond. We had a woman in town. Be careful now. Uh, who saw me one day and said, have you seen my signs? Uh, your signs? What signs? Well, it says Hidden Camp, Hidden Lake Camping Area. Good heavens, are those your signs? Well, she said, yes. Has anybody asked about them? I, oh, yes. A lot of people asked me where Hidden Lake was in Otisfield. And I said, there isn't any such place in Otisville, and she screamed and took on heading off and thought, no, you didn't, you didn't. <laughs> 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 it's the same over to Anonymous Pond in Harrison. Some idiot changed that to Crystal Lake. There's a Crystal Lake in every hamlet in the town in the state of Maine. <laughs> well, I always wonder what the real name for Pleasant Mountain might have been. You, you know it's not a real old name. Well, I mean, Ple I know it's Pleasant Mountain is a name. Shawnee Peak certainly isn't. That's yeah. something that's just happened. Yeah, the Shawnees didn't even love her. Uh, yeah, I wonder how many Shawnees there were yeah. around here. That's like uh, Quail Ridge up here. Quail? How many quail do you think ever went across that property? Not any. We don't have quail around here. Never did, not since I can remember, and I can remember back a ways. When you talk about Hidden Lake, I think you may be talking about an old friend of mine, Shirley Thomas. Uh, it's quite possible. <laughs> <laughs> won't go on the record for that one. She, in her last year, she was trying to write a musical about her childhood, and I tried to help her on it and help her get it produced. She had yeah. a lot of musical talent. Well, Shirley was awful mad at me the day I told her. I told everybody there wasn't any. <laughs> she uh, wouldn't get many customers <laughs> that way down to her little resort. No, <laughs> hardly. Yeah. Where was the town office? You must have had one. Uh, the town hall was the o at the foot of Bell Hill was the only town office that I remember. But uh, my father was first select man for a good many years, and those great big books that they had in those days, uh, I remember he and Charlie Robinson lying on the floor in our living room doing the books. He was moderator of the town of Otisville for a good many years and held every elective town office in the town of Otisville that I know of. And people used to ask me, your father 
held a lot of town offices. Why don't you run for school board? Why don't you run for select man or something? And I'd say, I am running, just as fast as I can away. <laughs> Didn't you mention once about your father being instrumental in bringing the telephone or electricity? Oh, uh, when I was going to school in Otisfield, I came home, sat on a wood box with my feet on the hat of a wood stove and studied by a kerosene lamp because there was no telephone, there was no electricity in the town of Otisfield when I was born. In fact, my father was more or less instrumental in getting both of those things into Otisfield. And I remember <laughs> the telephone in those days were a little different than they are now. And Dad installed all of the telephones in Otisfield. And in one old lady's, elderly lady's house, uh, he hitched a ground wire to a water pipe that came up at the end of the sink. And she sent word by a neighbor that her telephone wasn't working. And uh, so he went over to see what the matter was, and when he walked through the door, he looked and there wasn't any ground wire. Well, he said, what happened to the wire that was on that pipe? Oh, she said, I didn't like the looks of that, so I tied it to a horseshoe and put it in a pitcher of water, and it's in the pantry. <laughs> uh, I remember also that the winters used to start earlier than they do now and were a lot colder. And one Thanksgiving evening, Bob Baker, who lived down the back side of Scribner Hill, stopped and asked my mother if he could take me skating over on the outlet. Well, she said, is it safe? And he said, oh yes, of course it is, or I wouldn't ask him to go. So we went over and there was plenty of ice, but it had snowed a little, so there was patches that were white and there was dark patches. And the moon hadn't come up yet, and we were skating around. And at that time, there was some big stumps over there. And with the water movement, there was an area around one of them, 10 feet seems so, that was all open water. And oh. It was dark, like the ice, so I just skated right into it. And Bob said, I'll take you right home. And I wouldn't let him. If you take me home, my mother never will let me go skating again. So I stood in front of a big bonfire until I thought it was all dried out. But by the time I got home, they said, well, I hear you went swimming tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody had gotten home ahead of me. But that, that was quite often my fate. <laughs> uh, let me see, I was a junior in high school and I had a Model T Ford Coupe, and it had three foot pedals, and it had linings in the gearbox that controlled those. And uh, I was driving toward Oxford, and was going to turn into the building where I kept it, and Nell Martin. Oscar Martin's mother was learning how to drive and she had a Model T Ford. But she'd sit right back and look as though she was pushing on the steering wheel. But she was right in the middle of the road and my brake wouldn't hold on account of the brake bands had worn so and I started backing up and I didn't want to back into her and I backed right down into the brook. <sighs> and then Aaron Laud came along and saw I was in trouble and he had a long piece of wire cable and he hitched it onto me and pulled me out and I got it in the garage and was going to take up the brake bands and my father came home and I told my mother, don't you dare let 
live on because Dad's got a razor strap. <laughs> and he came in he said, well, son, I hear you gave the old four the bath today. <laughs> <laughs> so you can see, you can't get away with anything in Otisville. No. And then I went to school in Mechanic Falls, speaking of the Model T Ford. Uh, I went to school in Mechanic Falls because uh, at that time, I won't name any names, but I had a cousin who went to Bowdoin. And the principal of Oxford High School at that time was in my cousin's class. And most Otisville kids went to Oxford. But my cousin said to my father, if you let Ellis go to Oxford to that guy, I'll kick you. So my future brother-in-law, John Potter, was principal of Mechanic Falls, so I went to Mechanic Falls High School. And uh, the Model T Ford, uh, my father at that time was like man and said, let's go over to Bolster Mills and see. Oh. I don't remember his first name, Grover, because he was road commissioner. Well, we went over to Bolster's Mills, and, and uh, the old guy liked kids anyway, and he got talking to me, where do you go to school? Mechanic Falls. How do you get there? Well, I go up, I was living on Scribner Hill at that time, I go from Scribner Hill and walk to Oxford Station and take the train, which in those days was a steam locomotive. I don't know, that must be six, seven miles. I take the train to Mechanic Falls and I stayed down there, boarded down there during the week and then sometimes my dad would send somebody down after me. Well, Grover said, you, you ought to have an automobile. Well, I said, I know that. Well, why don't you have an automobile? Well, I said, I can't afford an automobile. Well, how do you know you can't afford an automobile? I said, because I don't have money enough to buy an automobile. You must be crazy. He said, no. He said, I've got one I'd sell cheap. Well, I said, it would have to be cheap. <laughs> well, he said, why don't you make me an offer? And I said, uh, I'll tell you, I, 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 can't, I can't afford to buy it. And he said, all right, I'll tell you, I'll take $15 for it. Oh, well, I told you I couldn't afford an automobile. <laughs> and he said, how much money you got with you? And I pulled out my pocketbook, and it's still a pocketbook. It's not a, anything else. And took my money out and I had nine dollars. And he said, sold. <laughs> so I drove that automobile to Mechanic Falls High School at least and back once a day, sometimes twice, and I guess once or twice, three times a day until the last day of school we went on a picnic and I met a guy on a sandy road and he didn't give me room and I went out in the bushes and that was the end of that Model T Ford. Did you get hurt too? No. No. I'm too tough to get hurt. <laughs> <laughs> so where did you meet Estelle? At Mechanic Falls High School? Uh, when I was living in Puglerville, I was... Puglerville? Now where's Puglerville? East Otisville. Puglerville. <laughs> right down below here. Uh, I probably was, oh, I don't know, five, six, seven years old. And still, my wife was seven years older than I was, and she had a horse. And she'd come down to my grandfather's door, and she wouldn't let me up behind her, on uh, behind the saddle. But I'd stand and hang on to the stirrup and walk way up here. And spend the afternoon with her and then turn around and walk home. So I suppose you can say that's uh, when Stella and I started going together. <laughs> of 
course, after I went to high school and she went to college, we both had girlfriends and boyfriends. But we finally got back together and had a good long life together and raised three children. Your father owned the store? My grandfather owned the store. But I used to go in the store. I was just a little kid, and I would put my hand on a counter and on a shelf behind it and swing. And he said, Ella, stop that. You're going to get hurt. And of course, I didn't stop. And of course, I did get hurt. I fell and put my thumb out of joint, and it all swelled up. And I went upstairs crying to my grandmother, and she put iodine on it, <laughs> and then wrapped it up, and it blistered. <laughs> Those were the good old days. Matt and Wiley and I grew up together, and his folks had a piece of corn over across the field, and Matt and I took our sickles after the corn had been picked for the corn shop. We had a corn shop in Otisville and one in Oxford in those days, and everybody planted corn for the corn shop. And uh, we cut all the corn fodder and was on our way home, and right out in the middle of the field there was a goldenrod stalk, and kids that we were, we both reached for it with our sickles at the same time, but he beat me and cut the end of my finger, and all there was was oh, about a quarter of an inch of skin and flesh hanging there. I went home and took hold of the end of it and said, look, man, the bone stuck out, and she passed out. <laughs> they called the doctor, and he came over, and he got out a pair of shears, scissors, whatever you want to call them, and my mother grabbed him. What are you going to do? He said, there isn't going to be blood enough in the end of that finger. I'm going to finish cutting it off. She said, oh, no, you aren't. Well, he said, it's not going to do any good to put it back on there because it, it won't heal, it, it'll die, there isn't blood enough. Yeah, well, you get to try. There I, it is. I still got it and I can bend the joint. Thank heavens for mothers, huh? Yeah. You said good old days, what was good about it? Well, that's what I wonder sometimes, but <laughs> we didn't have the troubles. And we didn't have the drugs. We didn't have the crime. Uh, we used to go out, slide in on bobsleds, slide down from up where Scribner Hill comes down to 121. We'd go up there and slide way down to Bert Jolson's, which is this side of Hugleville, and didn't have to worry about automobiles because there weren't any. I do remember one cold night, uh, I had a big crowd on the sled, and it was cold. I imagine it was below zero, but kids in those days, they didn't mind that. And we took the bobsled, but we got everybody crammed on it and broke a runner. I was sure I could wire it on somehow, and I found a piece of telephone wire. I didn't have any pliers or anything to cut it with, but I knew if I pounded it with a hammer, I could break it off. So I took it in the house and laid it on the edge of my mother's cast iron sink oh, and no. took the hammer, laid the wire on it, took the hammer, hit it once, and the sink went <laughs> oh. So we didn't do any more sliding that night, I'll tell you. Well, sounds like you were quite a rascal. Oh, yes, yeah. I, uh, I remember one day I was, when I was working in Portland, and, uh, of course, remember, I, I was a lot younger then than I am now. And the boss had a very nice-looking wife. And uh, he said, uh, take my car, Ellis, and take Madge home. I said, okay. 
as I said, she was nice looking, and uh, I was driving Congress Street toward Monjoy Hill, and of course I had to turn around while I was talking to her and look at her. And, and I turned around, and traffic was stopped in front of me, and I slammed on the brake, and I slammed into the car right ahead of me, and he into the next one. And the car ahead of me, this great big strapping man got out of the car, and, came back and I was getting smaller and smaller and smaller and sliding down farther in my seat. He had shoulders like a football player. And I was sure I'd had it. And he came along and he says, thanks, Bob. That keeps me awake. Turns around and gets in his car. Ah. Like, oh. <laughs> what a surprise that was. <laughs> uh, yeah. And you were a what, boss at uh, Robinson's? Oh, I went to uh, work at the Robinson Manufacturing Company. I worked there for a few years, 40 to be exact. And I started at the bottom and worked up and was boss of picking and carding, the first two operations in the woolen business. And now, I'm very sorry to say, the poor old woolen mill in another couple of months will be all done. Where is that located? In Oxford Village. Oh, I see. I've Robinson seen. Manufacturing Company. And they're going out of business because, uh, well, they paid very good wages for this area and people over across the puddle that will work for 50 cents an hour and make cloth like we were making and send it over here and sell it for half what we can make it for. It just puts them out of business. Mm. Now I asked uh, Howard if he knew Bill Spur. Did you know Bill Spur? I Who knew, wrote the history? I knew Bill Spur very well. And I knew his mother Lydia. And uh, my brother-in-law and I used to line bees. Most young folks today wouldn't have a clue what that means. But you catch a bee in a little box that's got a glass cover on it. And it's got uh, a little slide on the bottom and you put it over a flower and he flies up and you shut that. Of course he thinks because it's glass there that he can just fly away and he can't. And then you have a stand with another box on it that's got a piece of honeycomb with either sugar and water or honey or something. You put him on there and pull the thing out that's underneath him and he goes down and fills himself up full of honey, you just take the top box off, and invariably when he comes out, he flies around and around and around, and then, as they say, he takes off in a bee line. And they say that they always do that, they never fail. Well, I proved that is hogwash. <laughs> I proved beyond the possibility of a doubt that bees don't always go in the bee line because my brother-in-law and I were down to our camp on Lake Thompson, a little piece of land that jets out there a little ways, and it had some bamboo on it, and the bees loved that when it's blossomed. We caught one and we put it on a little stand, and when he took off, he went straight down the lake down to East Point. There's another point down below that comes out. So after they've gone back and forth, they bring others with them. You catch some in the box, and then you walk down to that point down there and set it up again, and you time the bees. You mark one of them with a little piece of chalk, and you can tell how long he's gone. And then you can keep doing that until you can find where the tree is. And then you cut the tree down and take the honey and put the bees in the hive and so on. 
But this day, that little bee came off and he went right straight down across the water. And he came back with a number of other bees and we'd take them in our box and go away down right in line where he went across the water and we couldn't get a bee back. And we thought that was mighty strange. We did that two Sundays, but the third day I said something wrong here. Now I got to find out what it is. Those bees aren't getting way down there. Well, John says they, they don't have a hive down in the water. No. And I said, no. So I took a boat and I went out. Now I said, you catch a bee and let him go. And he did, and the bee came off and he circled around and around. He went down a little ways, made a right angle turn, and the bees were in the tree within 15 feet of the shore of the lake. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, what else? Well, <clears throat> what about Joe Holden? You take that part every year. Uh, how many years you, have you been doing that? I haven't a clue. A good many. In fact, maybe you'd know better than I would. Uh, I don't know. It's have been, been quite a few. Have I been doing it ever since you can remember? Since you've been minister? Yes. And that's a day or two? Nineteen years. Nineteen years. Well, at least nineteen years I've been Joe Holden. In fact, during the summer, winter, spring, or fall, people come in quite often and say, Hi, Joe, because I'm the greeter at the door anyway. And I've enjoyed it, but I, I think it's about time for Joe to fade off into oblivion. <laughs> now, uh, you talked about some of the things you did when you were a boy that was, as he said, kind of like a rascal. There used to be dances, I think, somewhere in Otisfield. <laughs> did you ever get to those? I started going to those probably when I was 10 years old. And of course, in those days, they didn't call it a dance. They called it a social. But it was a dance, pure and simple. And in fact, the part of that building down there, the community hall, that they used to call Jolly Time, my father built as a garage, uh, right beside it, where that culvert goes through. In fact, I, I have a sky to show it. Uh, while they was building it, they threw stuff in there to fill it up and there was just a plank from the road to the garage, and I was all dolled up going to a social a dance, and uh, he said, Ella, stop your running, you're gonna get hurt. But there again, I didn't stop. I fell in and cut my hand from there to there, and Dr. I forget the name, and I said something about it just the other day, but was coming from from Portland to stay with Arthur Lowe, who was principal of Portland High School and lived on Scribner Hill. And he was going by, and uh, my father nailed him, and he came and patched me up, and there it is. And there was a man in town who was, uh, well, to put it polite, uh, a religious freak. And uh, he, had, he had a wooden leg. And when I say wooden leg, I mean he had a wooden leg. He didn't have a peg leg, he had a wooden leg. And people hired him to hold corn and so on. But he used to come down when they were building that garage and come in and they got awful sick of it. So one day one of the boys said, you know, Frank, they had a dance in this building last night. They did? Well, I'll never set foot in that place again. It's a den of iniquity. And so the boys were rid of Frank. 
But after that, the, the garage went out of business. Dad sold it to the Bean Boys, and they ran it for a while. And then it was moved on the back side of the community hall, and that's where we used to go to the... Well, in those days, they did call them dances. Uh, and I've danced more miles with more girls there. The Hartwell girls, that, uh, when they first came and built a camp on Lake Thompson, my father met their folks at the Oxford Station with a horse and wagon and brought them over. And they had several girls and they used to come to the dances and we just danced. Had a good time. Had a great time. In fact, I hear about it quite often when some of the family is around. Mm -hmm. What was the music like in those days? The music was uh, pretty good. It was Harley True from Norway. Do you know Harley True? No. Myron Gilman from Norway, who played the piano. Uh, I don't remember all the other names. But it was pretty good, and we did a lot of square dancing. And I don't mean square dance. we call them square dances, but not like they do today. They were contra dances, I suppose. Uh, we lined up the man here and the woman over here, and, and we used to do Lady of the Lake, Boston Fancy, and Hull's Victory. But House Victory was pretty complicated, and an awful lot of the young kids would get on that didn't have a clue how to do it and would ruin it. But Eddie Bean, uh, elderly lady who lived in town, would always, if I didn't go ask her, she'd always get up and come and ask me to do House Victory with her. So I spent a good many hours in that community building. Did you ever see Kirby Shaw and uh, his two syncopators, whatever it was called? Oh, yes. Bess Klein was with him? Yeah. Bess Klein was a music teacher in Norway. Yeah. And her little house, the trees have grown up in front of it now. Yeah. It's all shaded. I used to go to the Pirate's Den. Oh, yeah. Up on Norway Lake. And one summer when I was working in Portland, probably 1933, I missed one Saturday night dance at Old Orchard Pier with the old big bands, Jimmy Dorsey, Cab Calloway, Swing and Sway with Sammy Kay, and all of those big bands. And uh, I missed just one all summer. And the only reason I missed that, I was sick of bed. Did you ever hear any of the old time of fiddling and, and like Millie Dunham? Like Millie Dunham. Like Millie Dunham. Oh yes. Yeah. And Nate Noble and uh, Roy White for the Nate, bass. Nate Noble. Uh, I can't remember who. Whose father? He's father of Lona Bedard. Yeah, but what about Bert Noble? No, I don't know. Well, he was a young fella that went to work for me in the mill. And uh, then he got married and had a little boy and lived on Crockett Ridge. And uh, after he got done at the mill, and I hadn't seen much of him, uh, he went snowmobiling on North Pond, North Pond and went through the ice and was drowned. Oh, too bad. My kids went, well, my oldest daughter went two years to Madden Alcock Academy in Lincoln, Maine, because we had relatives there, and they wanted her to come up and stay with them, and she did two years, but then she came down, and my other two children, they drove back and forth in an old Chevrolet pickup truck that I bought for a little or nothing to Casco, and so they all went to Casco High School. A uh, friend of mine who lived in Spurs Corner went to Casco, and 
I went to Mechanic Falls, but Saturday night we'd get together and go to Martin's Pavilion in Naples because uh, his father played in the orchestra at that time. And he had two awful nice looking sisters and they were awful nice dancers. So I never missed many of those dances. I <laughs> <laughs> guess not. <laughs> what, about, <clears throat> what about rock and roll? You didn't have rock and roll. Oh, we did. We rolled and rocked quite a lot. <laughs> yeah. Of course, I didn't quit until I was getting old and pretty decrepit, so. And in fact, I, I oh, what? No later than two or three years ago, I had a little bout of dancing, but I tuck it out pretty quickly, so <laughs> I've called it quits. What do you miss about those old days? When you think about it, what do you wish you could have again? Well, the camaraderie within the people of Otisville was much different than it is now. Otisville has become a, a bedroom town. There's no industry in the town of Otisville. Everybody gets up early in the morning, jumps in their automobile and goes work somewhere else, comes back and goes to bed. and. Otisville gets up in the morning and goes to work. So there isn't the camaraderie, you know, the visiting back and forth, and uh, and people live so fast today. It's it's the same here. My daughter and I'll go somewhere and I'll say, I, I would like to stop and see so-and-so. Well, we don't have time. <laughs> yeah. I, I thought when I retired, I could do anything I wanted to. I don't know how I did half I did when I was working, because I, I I don't have time to do it all now. Hmm. Uh, a wonderful woman from West Paris, you might know her, uh, Letty Brooks. She said, the thing I miss about the old days is people don't have the interests or the time to neighbor with one another. That's right. We used to do that. And she said, you know, uh, any child could go into any house, whether they knew the owners or not, and right away they'd be offered a place at the table, sit down, and have something to eat, have yep. some pie, have something to drink. Or if they came in in the morning, uh, somebody would say, just a minute, and I'll get the coffee going. They'd put on the coffee pot yeah. and have donuts or whatever was handy. Uh, we do miss that. Uh, and things have changed a lot anyway. Uh, my wife and I had a barn full of dairy cows. We started with one cow and worked up and when we first got married we were making butter and selling it until we were making so much butter we couldn't take care of it. And then we started selling milk. And, and then uh, we bought a milking machine and a milk cooler. And then they wanted us to put in the milk tank and I was working second shift in the mill. I tried third shift but I'd get home uh, seven o'clock in the morning and I'd work all day and been there time to go to work and I hadn't been to bed so I worked the second shift for I think it was 26 years from choice and then the doctor told me either give up famine or give up the mill, and there was no money in famine, so guess which I gave up. Yeah, you're right. Do you miss the you know, livestock, the animals, the cows? Well, my son-in-law just bought two Percheron uh, geldings that are only two years old. He wanted to train them himself. So we're back in the animal business. Hey, good. And it seems kind of good to have animals in the band. They have fixed it up a lot from what it was and are still working on it and have fenced the fields with electric fence. And so are those right here or are you talking about another place? Right here. Right here at this house, yeah. And uh, deer go across these fields. We sit here and look out the window and see deer go across. And with two strands of electric fence, everybody thinks a deer uh, we'll jump over the fence, and we all know how high a deer can jump. Mm. 
But we sat right here and the deer would come to that fence and a very strange thing happens. They go like that under the bottom strand of electric fence. They don't bother to jump over it. And the day that my son-in-law and my daughter moved in with me, they'd been in Wisconsin for 30 years, better than 30 years. We were sitting at my kitchen table out in the other end of the house, and Kelly said, I'd like to see a moose right out there in that field. And uh, in about five minutes, Joe said, uh, Kelly, look out the window, there's your moose. And right up by the bulkhead on the neighbor's lawn stood a big bull, and he walked down across the field, way down across that field and across 121. And I hollered to Kelly to get my camera, and she went out and took half a dozen pictures of it. That's something. Yep. Talk about psychic uh, energy. Yeah. And of course, we see turkeys for the dozens. Well, when we pulled in the driveway, there were a bunch of turkeys crossing your Down barn, here. your farm, your barnyard. Right? Where did we park, Gert? They were between. Uh, uh, Ina's house and going into the woods. Going yeah, this. yeah, yeah. Well, there was six of them right out in the dooryard the other day. Yeah. And we've seen as many as 30 right over here in the field. And I used to do a lot of fishing. And now it takes two people to get me into the boat and three to get me out, so I don't do as much fishing. But I still go to West Branch Pond way up. Kakajo Way, beyond Moosehead Lake, uh, a little West Branch Pond is nothing but a bulging, I think it's the Pleasant River, there's three of them, first, second, and third, and it's never been stocked. They're native trout, and this spring we went early, the week before Memorial, and caught trout anywhere from eight to twelve inches long, one right after the other. It was great. And I still love to do that. I used to do a lot of ice fishing, but uh, now that I'm unsteady on my feet, ice and I don't get along very well. And I used to go with short sleeves, no matter what the weather was, and enjoy it. And now I'm cold if the sun goes under a cloud. <laughs> You still go to Masonic meetings, though, don't you? Oh, occasionally I go to Masonic meetings. Uh, uh, let me see. In six years, I will have been a Mason for 40 years. Have you ever been in the Grange? Yes, I was in the Grange once, a good many years ago. Otisfield Grange in Spurs Corner, out of existence, and half of the building is over here at the foot of Pico Hill, Lindley Pico bought it and moved it over here. And I went to see somebody get their 40-year pin just a little while ago, and I stood up and congratulated him and said I wanted him to be there when I got mine. And that was only six years from now. But I said, I, I'd love rather have you wait and come when I get my 50th, because I'll only be 105 then. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I'm really interested in Joe Hold and the real history about him. Any of the little uh, things you've heard about him over the last 30 or 40 years that well, you could tell us? Of course, the, the story about his proving beyond any possibility of a doubt that the Earth is flat and stationary, and the sun and moon do move. They're the ones that move. But this good old Earth of ours didn't very likely that it go spinning around and around all over the place. What would happen to us? We'd be bottom side up. We'd go <laughs> off into space. Well, I, I got sick of hearing these guys saying that it was round and going spinning all over the place. So. I decided I'd do an experiment. 
So late one afternoon, I went out and I got a stake and I drove it in the ground. And I used a level, so I hit it perfectly up straight. And then I used a square and cut it off square on the top. And I nailed a, a board on top of that, a flat board. And then I went and got a pail, a tin pail, and filled it almost full of water. But I'm a crafty old cuss, you know, so I took a pencil and I marked on the outside the pail right how high that water came so that I could tell if any of the water had gone out of that pail. And I went in and ate my supper and said my prayers and said good night to the cat and dog and crawled into bed. And the next morning I got up and I went right out and looked in that pail and there wasn't nary a drop of water gone out of that pail. Well, don't you think if in the middle of the night this poor old earth had turned bottom side up, that water, pail and all, would have gone off into space somewhere? Well, you're dead. Uh, I mean, you're jolly well right it would. <laughs> what do you think? We're all dumb? Of course we aren't. This poor earth is flat and stationary. It stays right here. You don't feel it moving around, do you? Of course not. <laughs> And then they talk about poor old Joe Holden. Don't know what he's talking about. But there's a lot of flatlanders around now because I used to travel all over the country telling about my theory. I went to the Chicago Wells Fair. I went to Washington and told them in Congress about it. And they all thought that I was pretty smart. But there are still some of these skeptics that don't know whether they're going or coming. Now, wasn't there someone who challenged you and you did another experiment with a chamber pot? Well, that wasn't quite true, I don't think. I don't remember it myself. Yeah. But uh, I've heard I did that, but you know, I'm so ancient now, I may have forgotten all about it. <laughs> Well, you play the part well, Ellis. I do. I, I do forget things. I'm sorry to say, but my memory ain't what it used to be. My eyesight, eyesight isn't what it used to be. But I, I still have a good time. Still keep going. I bet you'd like to go back to some of those contra dances. Oh, yes. Yes. With those pretty young gals and all the music and yeah. the old time music? Oh, yes. We had an awful lot of fun. We even used to have a fair in Otisfield. Really? Oh, yes. They, uh, down by the community hall, my mother and Eddie Bean, I guess, had a booth where they sold hot dogs and stuff. And, and they always had fireworks and that is what ended the, the fair because at one of the fireworks uh, a skyrocket got loose and hit a girl right over the hat and she died and that was the end of the fairs in Otisfield. How long ago was that? Oh, a long, long time ago. I can't remember. As I say, my memory isn't very good. That's really sad. Yeah. But I did she have? Did they say she she had had uh, heart problems before that? Or no, no, no. With just the, the thrust of being yeah. hit. Yeah. Yeah. But Matt and Wiley lived right across the road from where I did. We grew up together. I went to high school and his father told him that if he didn't go to high school and stayed home with him and found he'd buy him a brand new Model A Ford. And he did. And I think it was less than a thousand dollars. I don't remember that exactly, but I think it was. And Martin and I had a lot of 
childhood experiences. There was a Cooper shop. Most people wouldn't even know what a Cooper shop is today, but it's where they made barrel, barrel staves and they had to steam them in order to shape them, bend them. And there was a cupola up on top that was wide open except it had louvers in it to let the steam out. I was still in grade school and Martin was too because we was in the same grade. We were coming home and we heard this racket and the Cooper shop was right across from the mill pond so we went around and there was a partridge and it was in the fall of course because we was going to school. And I didn't have a gun at that time, and Martin says, I'll go home and get my father's. And he went home and got a shotgun, but he didn't dare shoot it. So I shot the partridge up in the cupola. <laughs> so that was the first partridge I ever shot. The second partridge I ever shot, I, uh, I wasn't quite as proud of doing that, but I wanted a gun, and my father we went rich, and he wanted about to buy me an expensive gun, but somebody owed him some money. And they wanted to pay him, but they couldn't, and they came one day and said, I've got this 22, you've got a boy growing up here. Why don't I give you the 22 with fat payment? Well, Dad said, yes, he wants a gun, all right. So they made a deal, but the 22 barrel was leaded up so that I think the bullets came out and went like this. Oh. And I had a brown spaniel, and uh, of course I was still in grade school, and I got home from school and went up in the pasture where there was some old apple trees. And the dog put the partridge up and he lit in an apple tree. And today uh, you flush a partridge and sh she flies out of the country. But in those days, that bird flew up in the apple tree and sat there, and I shot seven times at her with a twenty-two rifle. And as I say, <laughs> you never knew where the bullet was going to go, but the last one hit in the wing, and she came down on the ground and ran around, got snarled up in some brush, and I killed her with a club. And I thought that I had accomplished something. <laughs> <laughs> something great. Seven <laughs> shots, and you hit her in the wing. Yeah. Oh dear. I think you were better off catching skunks. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, catch, catching partridges that you shot the wing was less melee than catching skunks. <laughs> <laughs> I guess. <laughs> Did you know any of the Finnish people in this area? I talked oh, to a woman yes. named Gino, and she went to the something like a Swampville. 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 She lived over there. Yeah. yeah. What was her name? Vienno, and I can't, she married a Falk, so we all know her as Vienno Falk. But her uh, Finnish name, it, I think it was Koronen or Mikonen. Koronen, probably. Koronen, I there think. There were some Koronens in town. Yeah. There was Dickonens in town, and Wallows in town, and Johnsons she, in she town. She said that she and her pretty sisters, when they were young girls, They'd go out to take the sauna, and one time they were going along, there was about 30 feet out to the sauna house. And one time they were going out, and their father noticed there was a whole bunch of boys that hid their bicycles down in the grass, and they were trying to get a good look. Yeah. So he built a hedge, and from then on, his daughters had <laughs> privacy. Well, I, I've been in a Finnish sauna years ago. Hmm. A boy that worked for me in the mill, his family had a sauna. Chocolas did, didn't they? Yeah, this was uh, only Rasima. Did you know the Rasimas in Norway? I've only been there since 79. Oh, yeah. Well, I, I worked a couple years in the, the shoe shop in Norway. I also worked for Gladys Applin, who ran a restaurant in Norway. I was going with my wife. She was away teaching school. No, I guess she was still in college. And 
they put in a cooler cake system and sold beer. And you had a long rod with a faucet on the end of it. And you unscrewed this, this uh, screw on the top and took the rod and slammed it down through. <coughs> but then you had to tighten up this wing nut. Well, they had showed me how to do it, and along came a night when there was nobody there, and one keg ran out, so I got another one, and uh, I did an awful good job. I got the rod and got it down through, but I forgot, and I didn't tighten up that wing nut before I let go of the rod and the rod went up and poked a heel hole in the ceiling and wet everybody in the restaurant down with beer. And about that time, my wife-to-be walked in, and she wasn't, didn't approve of people drinking beer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, boy, <laughs> that's quite a story. That was quite the thing. Well, I guess you have really had an interesting life. Oh, yes and still very interesting. Yeah. What's the, what do you like to do the most these days? Well, I can't do much these days. My chief occupation these days, uh, when it doesn't rain, is mowing this dooryard. I have a ride in lawnmower, of course, but it only takes me four or five hours because we mow the front lawn, the back lawn, the side lawn, and half of the fields. And I do do some cooking. Uh, my wife had Alzheimer's for a good many years, and if I wanted to eat and nobody can say I didn't eat, uh, I had to cook. So if my daughter is real busy, sometimes I do some cooking. The latest sewing circle of the, uh, the scholarship fund is having a sale. Sometimes I make three loaves of bread, a batch of biscuits, a, a bowl for them. I can't read much because I have to use a reading glass. Try to hold a newspaper in both hands and read it with a reading glass. It's a lot of fun. <laughs> Maybe you could get some kind of a rack to lean it on. Oh, they have things, but they want about $2,500 for oh, yeah. it. That you can just put a book under it. And yeah, not worth it. No. And he greets everyone with a, a good greeting every Sunday morning. Uh, every Sunday morning, Alice is at church greeting people and uh, making them feel welcome. So. Uh, actually sets the tone for the Sunday service. I think he's greeted me a few times, me and my daughter, on, on Joe Holden Day even. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. You're not just the celebrity uh, star who hides in the wings. You're out there at the doorstep, as I recall. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. Well, I have been as well as Gertrude and I say for at least 19 years because it's before she got there. It, And an awful lot of the people that used to go there aren't there anymore. My peers all went and left me. I've lived too long. I have a dear friend who I guess is not coming so much anymore. Do you know, uh, uh, now why have I, why has that name slipped me? Babbitt, Paul Babbitt. Oh yes, I know Paul. Yeah. And his wife. His wife is dead. Yeah, Nancy. Yeah. Yeah, they were friends of mine. A wonderful man. So was Nancy. Yeah. Wonderful woman. Yeah. But, but life uh, goes on. Guy Tucker. His wife worked down the camp, owned Camp Weevil for a while. But I remember way back when Camp Weevil first started, uh, my grandfather was running the store, and of course, oh, 
1920s or so, people thought a little different than they do today. Those girls all wore midi blouses and bloomers. And the bloomers, of course, came just below their knees and they were showing their legs. And they walked, would come up in canoes to Pugliville, which all call it Pugliville Cove, East Otisville Cove, in canoes and get out and come up to the store and come in to buy candy or ice cream or something. And my grandfather thought that was hideous to see those girls showing their legs like that. What's this world coming to? <laughs> Isn't it all relative, huh? <laughs> uh, very relative. And now we're down to the days of bikini bathing suits. Uh, yeah. Uh, some of them, I, I don't know, I've, I've had a handkerchief a lot bigger than that bathing suit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's funny. <laughs> I guess there was a time they almost wore a completely covered at the beach. I've seen the old artworks of Winslow Homer. Oh yes, Homer, I remember. All covered up. Well, I I shocked everybody uh, years ago when I went swimming with a pair of trunks, and no top on. Oh really? Uh, my first one that I remember that I had without a top did have a top with a zipper that I could take it off if I wanted to. But I, it was pretty risque when I showed up with, with just a pair of shorts on. Yeah. Hard to believe. You know what ails it? that boy anyway? He probably never amount to anything. <laughs> he has to be such a big show off. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I was always a show off. Matt and Wiley and I, as I've told you before, grew up together and he had some, I don't know, I guess they were cousins from Bangor. And they'd started building a a fence around Martin's dooryard, but they hadn't got any of the railings up, just the fence posts. And these people always came down Memorial Day. And they had an awfully nice looking daughter, about my age. And uh, I lived right across the road. And of course, when I saw that car drive in, I rushed right over there. And uh, I wanted to show my prowess and I climbed up on top of one of those fence stakes and sat there talking to the girls. And then they started moving off and I decided to jump down. Well, I did. And the only trouble, I left the whole seat of my pants on the fence post. Oh. And then I, I didn't want to turn around and back over to my house. So what do I do? Back over or put my hands over my bottom and run? <laughs> what did you do? <laughs> a little of both. If I <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, that's well I think I've told you. <laughs> okay, well, that's too much already. I'm Thank beginning to think so. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. It'll only go downhill from here, won't it? <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, with Gertrude here, I, I've been kind of cautious what I told her anyway. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thank heavens. Well, it's it's clean enough for television, too. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, today, how clean does it have to be? Not at all. <laughs> uh, did you get that in there? Yeah. <laughs> well, thanks very much. You're very welcome. Good day, sir.